our time of Bible reading, we're going to look at Luke chapter 10, verse 38 to 42. Um, how about uh, we pray as we come to God's word? Loving Father, we are so thankful that you do love us so much. We are so thankful for Jesus. As we read your word today, we pray that your Holy Spirit would be at work in our, our lives, our hearts, our minds, and draw us closer to Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. So Luke chapter 10, starting at verse 38. As Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. She had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. She came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? Tell her to help me. Martha, Martha, the Lord answered, you are worried and upset about many things, but few things are needed, or indeed only one. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. Happy Mother's Day. Um, my name's uh, David, if you're joining us for the first time, and I'm uh, the lead pastor here. Uh, and let me say uh, that we do recognise that Mother's Day is not a happy day for some. Uh, there is grief and pain, disappointment. Um, there's longings that things would be different. And today might be especially painful for you. And if that is you, I, I just want to say thank you for joining us. Um, it is really important that you have. Um, thank you for going through the discomfort because it's worth celebrating Mother's Day, isn't it? And I think it's especially important to celebrate Mother's Day in the day we live, in a world where roles in families are somewhat confused, um, where mothering can be undervalued. It's important for us, I think, as God's church, to celebrate mothers, to, for us to recognise that the role of mothering is an honourable role. To say that mothers matter. Uh, it's a wonderful blessing to have a loving mum. Mums are great, aren't they? Uh, only a mum will let you lick their ice cream before they have a lick. You know, not they'll only let their children lick the ice cream, but <laughs> and, and probably younger children, not the older ones. We know mums do some really yucky things for their children. Uh, I mean, mums. They do the job of raising their children right. You know, they, they, they come across as if, you know, everything's in order. They, they correct out, you know, help us use the right words, dress the right way. Um, but every mum has a story lurking in the background of poo, wee or vomit. And they can bring it out at any moment. It's great that lo mums love us so much that they put up with their yucky things. Um, and as an adult, looking back on mums, often we reflect and realise our mums put up with some, well, far yuckier things that came out of us than poo or wee or vomit. And for that, we're thankful. Mums make us feel like we belong. 
they, they help us, our houses turn into homes. They, they even help us feel like we belong, even when we're having a bad day. And they're the brunt of that bad day. In talking to mums, and what we've heard so far as well, here's what I worked out about mums. Being a mum is hard work. Some mums are very busy, especially when kids are dependent on them. They're often busy doing things that need to happen. Mums love us so much, they're, they're willing to do some pretty disgusting things. But for many mums that I speak to, the hardest thing about being a mum is not what they do and the busy lives that they lead doing. The hardest thing about being a mum is the things that they can't do, the things that they're not in control of. And that's come up as mums have spoken even today. Mums aren't in control of how their children will grow up. They don't have that control over sicknesses. They don't have control over how other people out there will treat their child. Mums have less and less control over the decisions their children make as they grow up. Now, that's a good thing and sometimes something to celebrate as because the idea is that um, mums raise their children to be dependent, independent. Um, And so that's a thing to celebrate, but sometimes when poor decisions are made, um, it brings heartbreak and hard times. And while we celebrate mothers today, the truth is that none of us are in control of life. Don't get me wrong, we have moments of control. There's things that we can do that can kind of bring us some control. Like, if you don't want to get sick, it's good to stay healthy and keep fit and do some exercise or whatever, and eat the right things and all that kind of stuff. Uh, there's things that we can uh, get some kind of control, but let's not fool ourselves. We have very little control over the world, over things. And, and not only do we have, not only don't have control over things... The world we don't have control over is a broken world. Um, it's a funny thing. I've, um, in our family, I've become a bit of the, the, the crash test dummy. I'm the one who initially teaches our kids to drive, does that first few hours, uh, gets them in the car behind the wheel. Uh, a few of our kids have got their licences now and they have their licences for a while, but I don't know if it's post-traumatic stress or what it is, but when I'm in the passenger seat with my kids driving there's a level of anxiety that comes over me where I, I, I just grab hold of handles. <laughs> um, and it's a bit tense for me and I say things that I didn't mean to say uh, and it's, uh, it's pretty nasty. I'm not a very good backseat driver. Imagine though, even as bad as that is and as uncomfortable it is for me to not be in control, Imagine if I was in a car with them driving with no brakes and the wheel nuts half undone. Imagine how anxious it would be then. We live in a world that's broken. The wheel nuts are half off and there's no brakes and we are not in control. If at times you feel anxious about life, there is good reason. The wheels have fallen off because we've turned our back on our Creator. That's what our Bible tells us. And so there is sin, there is sickness, there is evil. There's even death, all of which we have no control over and could be ruined by them at any moment. And that is why when 
when the um, when we, the, we hear of Jesus in the Bible, the Bible writers talk it as talk it as the they call it the gospel, the good news, and this is the good news speak, speaking into this broken world that we have no control over. Here is the good news about Jesus. Because while we're not in control, God is. Because it is his creation. And God loves, loved us so much, he's willing to do a pretty disgusting thing. And while disgusting it is, it's a beautiful thing because it's done because of his love for us. He entered his creation and became man. This happened 2,000 years ago. You can actually, if we can actually mark it in our calendars. Um, we can even mark the place. This is an historical event that took place. God entered our history and, it can, and so therefore God can be checked out. When we're talking about this good news, we're not talking about wishful thinking. We're not talking about myths or legends or, uh, or, or fairy tales. This is an historical event. Jesus entered our history. If you're curious about whether this is an historical event or not, the facts can be checked out. Uh, if you want to talk to me later, um, feel free. There are books I can lend you. There's studies you can do, and I'm happy to chat and answer any questions. The fact is, this is kind of real stuff, which is really exciting because this is real good news that comes into a broken world that we have no control over. For now, though, I just want to keep on assuming we're on top of the evidence of what God has done because I want to get to that, the significance of that little story that was read for us about Mary and Martha. You see, Jesus came to bring in God's new kingdom, a kingdom that is not broken, a kingdom of which he is the king of. Uh, that's, the time, that's the title he's been given, the Christ. It means king. And so Jesus comes as the Christ, the king of this kingdom that's unbroken as opposed to a broken world. Luke puts together this orderly account, we're told right at the beginning of his uh, uh, account of what Jesus did, his gospel, his good news of what Jesus did. He, he tells us that he's put together this orderly account of Jesus' life. So There's probably a thousand taught stories he could have told, but he chose some because there was reasons for why he told them. And he, he gives us, in these stories he puts together is to give us a clue what this kingdom, this unbroken kingdom that Jesus is bringing in, will be like. And so as you read the beginning of Luke's story of Jesus' life, or his account of Jesus' life, you see that Jesus does some crazy things. Um, the sick are healed because he has control over sickness. Um, he, the evil spirits are cast out because he has control over sin and evil. Creation is subdued and dead were even raised. It's kind of like a, it seems the brokenness of the world that we can observe with our own eyes, when the Christ came, that was all reversed for a moment. But even more, Luke tells us that what Jesus does is quite amazing. Jesus not only does the, all these amazing things, but he does this thing that only God could do. He offers God's forgiveness. He deals with the issue of sin. People can be forgiven. And they can follow this Jesus and be part, therefore, of his kingdom. They can be what they call disciples, uh, which brings you into the kingdom. And that brings us to the two stories, or the story of the two sisters that was read for us, uh, Mary and Martha. See, they were disciples of Jesus. Uh, they were his followers when Jesus was doing his world tour. And Jesus came to visit them. And so, as you would expect um, anyone to do when someone who you're following, when your king comes to visit you, Martha gets busy doing the necess necessary things of a good host. Mary... On the other hand, she sits around at Jesus' feet. And there's a contrast there. There was a bit of work to do. And I imagine Martha was watching Mary out of the corner of eye, her eye, just sitting there, while Martha went around doing all the things that needed to be done. 
she knew a meal isn't just going to cook itself. Someone's got to cook the meal. Someone's got to get it ready. Great to sit there at Jesus' feet, but that was a luxury that Martha couldn't afford. Both ladies were devout followers. The story goes, and I imagine when Martha could you know, take it no more, she said to Jesus, and I don't know if this is a half joke, but you know, like um, a truth spoken in jest kind of thing, or whether she was serious, but the message is still there. She says, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? Tell her to help me. And that seems like a reasonable quest, whether it was said in jest or whether it was a kind of like a frustration. It, it seems reasonable. That's good. Now, we've heard the story. We've read the story. We know that, you know, that she's wrong. But, but if you're reading this for the first time, you go, no, she's right. As a reasonable request, when, you, when, a, when your king comes to visit, you prepare a meal, you make it nice for them. You get busy doing the work. If, if you've kind of left a few things, you quickly hurry and duck them, shove them in a room somewhere, they're, they're out of sight, you do a quick vacuum, you kind of... There's lots to do. There's meals to cook. There's things to at least warm up. What is surprising is not Martha's request. What is surprising in this story is Jesus' response. Martha, Martha, the Lord answered. Now, that's a kind of a cultural thing, saying her name twice. This is like a gentle kind of warmth Jesus has towards Martha. He loves her and he wants to speak to her tenderly. Martha, Martha. You are worried about and upset about many things. But few things are needed, or indeed only one. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. And if you're reading this for the first time, without preconceived ideas, just hearing the story for it is, we've got questions in our head. How has Mary chosen the better? How is it better to go hungry? How is it better for the baby to have a full, keep a full nappy? How is it better for the family not to have a meal ready? How is it better to not have everything in place, not have everything ordered? How is it better hospitality? How is it better loving? How is it more useful in any kind of way just to sit there? It makes no sense to not be busy when there's so many things to be busy doing. It makes no sense to not worry about getting everything done. But Jesus is saying, what Jesus is saying here is actually counterintuitive. If we were reading this for the first time, we wouldn't get it unless Jesus said it, because it makes no sense. How is it better? And actually, the story of Mary and Martha uh, is a story used by Luke, Luke to teach what it means to follow Jesus. And we don't get why Mary chose the better until the end of Luke's story. This is just a question that meant, it meant to rattle around your brain as you keep on reading through Luke's gospel, because you go, how is that better? How is it better just to sit at his feet? And you don't get it until you see Jesus die on a cross, be buried, and raised three, day, three days later. And then you get it that, there's, that I am not in control the world is broken and that is a big thing and I can't fix it. All I can do is sit at his feet. All I can do is trust in him. 
Why is it better for Mary? Why is Mary chosen the better way? Because when the Lord and Saviour comes to your house, all you can do is sit. We'll always be tempted to think that following Jesus is about doing things. Being religious, being a good person, loving your neighbour. Actually, there's a story just before this story about a good Samaritan. That's the, the outcome, love your neighbour and... and, and, and and we'll think that following Jesus is about loving your neighbour, but no, it's not. It's about sitting before Jesus because we can do nothing to fix the situation that we are in with a broken world. All we can do is sit before him and trust him to do the work. And that is uh, the good news. Jesus comes to bring healing in our broken world. To bring forgiveness and to bring life eternal. We have no control, but he has. And that's a good thing. And our, our lack of control will, rise, will, will cause our anxiety levels to rise. And it's tempting to... Deal with those anxiety levels by getting busier, by doing more things, by trying harder, by uh, trying to fix the situation. But as Jesus speaks to Mary, he speaks to mums today and he speaks to us here now. It's better to sit in him. Whatever that may look like for you. And as um, our mums testify today... It's a wrestle to continue to sit in him. We will be tempted to fix, but only he can ultimately fix uh, the world that we live in. And so we are called to trust him. He holds us. He heals us. He dies for us. And he gives us life. The question we have, Will you trust him in just sitting? Let me pray. Uh, Heavenly Father, we do thank you for your love for us. That you not only came amongst us, but you died for us. Uh, we pray, uh, Lord, that you'll help us by your grace to be able just to sit and trust you for life, for salvation. Amen.